All right. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening. My name is Celeste Martinez, and I'm the founder and owner of Celeste Alegria, Igniting Joy Through Transformation. I work with individuals and organizations to ignite joy through transformation. Um, before I became a life coach, a facilitator, and a consultant, um, I was a community organizer for 10 years. And my organizing career started as a student and then continued to expand in varying roles with different nonprofits here in the Denver metro area. Through my nonprofit experience, I was exposed to various organizing methodologies, processes on how to organize that are proven to be effective in various local communities in Colorado, as well as across the country. My personal, professional, and educational opportunities inform how I approach this overall research project. So to share a little bit more about this particular series that we're here for today and this project, Learning from our past can help shape our reality and future. Learning from history is an antidote to individualism because this recognizes that our efforts for justice are intergenerational of who came before, who is here now, and the generations to come. In the fall of 2020, the Colorado Trust reached out to me to create a report um, in support of their current grant program known as Building and Bridging Power. One of the guiding questions for this report was what kind of organizing models are most common in the state of Colorado and in our greater landscape? In answering this question, the intent was for the Colorado Trust staff to be more informed so they could better support grantees in connecting with potential resources and opportunities especially since several of the grassroots organizations for this grant project were under a uh, process of developing or redefining what their organizing programs focus on. The approach I used to answer this question was which schools of thought are behind the majority of organizing models in Colorado and why? And this resulted in explaining the origins of Solinsky's community organizing methodology because several of the most common models are either directly informed by this original methodology or are derived from this ideology. This is not only common to Colorado, but also nationally across the nonprofit sector. Additionally, this trend is reflected in the history of how Solinsky's methodology established credibility and was then institutionalized, and it was then to institutionalize the profession of being a community organizer in the nonprofit sector. One of the ways that Alinsky furthered credibility of his methodology was distinguishing his form of community organizing from that of black indigenous people of color and the social movements that they organized and led. This created a wedge between the two making these forms of power building efforts to appear as completely different rather than seeing their intersections and similarities. And overall, this has created a racial inequity where the stories of BIPOC-led efforts are not as recognized um, or learned from, especially in the nonprofit sector and in academia. As a result, many organizers and community leaders do not learn from this history and have that to inform their present power building efforts. And all of this is really important because in understanding our history, this can help us to adapt new strategies to what we are facing in this present time. It can help us not be so predictable to decision makers when we are coming against up against certain struggles. And this also is important so that we can see these stories as sources of inspiration and part of the greater power building. So the overall purpose of this series is that the intention of this historical and sociological research is to ensure that present and future generations 
of community organizers and leaders can draw inspiration from this research. Additionally, the intention is to center the stories of social movements that are led by black, indigenous, and people of color, and how each of these movements often collaborated or were in solidarity with one another when it came for the fight for racial and social justice. Therefore, with the financial support of the Colorado Trust, I had the opportunity to develop two research papers. The first was the impacts of Solinsky's methodology on community organizing and BIPOC-led efforts. And the second, which this series is focused on, is historical BIPOC social movements in the US and Colorado. And this includes summaries and a concurrent timeline of BIPOC-led movements both nationally as well as in our state for civil rights, the Black Panther Party, American Indian Movement, the Chicano Movement, and the San Luis land rights struggle. And this is why we are here today, to learn from the stories of collaboration and overlap between BIPOC-led social movements in Colorado. This fall education series focuses on each one of these social movements, and each session includes a short lecture, this one might be a little longer than the others, um, that shares the origins of each movement, core leaders and significant events um, and actions, followed by a panel of people who are either directly involved in these movements, our family of core leaders, or our present day historians and archivists. Which brings me to introduce today's panelists. Um, today we have with us Nita Gonzalez, um, who is a very renowned leader in our community, as well as the daughter of Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez, who we're gonna be learning about this evening. We also have with us Deborah Montoya, who is also a very prominent leader in our community from the east side of Denver. Um, and um, we'll be sharing her wisdom in this space. We also invited Teresa Trujillo um, to our panel this evening, who's from Pueblo, Colorado, and I'll share more about her later. She unfortunately is not feeling well, so couldn't join us this evening, um, but we will still learn a little bit about her when we begin our panel conversation. Well, there's a lot to dive into, so let's get started. First, let's talk about what does the term Chicano mean? As Armando B. Rendon describes in the prologos of the Chicano Manifesto, the word Chicano was claimed as a shared identity to describe a different cultural and political reality faced by Mexican Americans in the United States and was an attempt to coalesce generally disparate efforts of the Southwestern region of the United States. The term Chicano then captures the racial and ethnic experience of Mexican Americans as people who are most commonly a racial mixture of Indian and Spanish while being cultured by whiteness because of living in the United States. So when referencing Chicano in today's lecture, we are really focused on the history of Mexican Americans, Mexican descendants who became US citizens largely due to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo being signed in 1848 at the conclusion of the Mexican-American War, where the US acquired what is now referred to as the Southwest, which includes California, Arizona, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas. Additionally, it is important to note that the term Chicano was self-selected by Mexican-Americans during the 1960s and 70s rather than unifying around terms that were selected by the US federal government to classify people's cultural and ethnic experiences, such as the terms Hispanic and then later Latino. Chicanismo is still an identity and culture that exists to this present day. And while its meaning has broadened in the sense that people who are not of Mexican descent can also identify with this term, it is most common to hear this applied to those who recognize their mixed ancestry, are resisting against white supremacy culture, and are politically active in their communities. 
Lastly, it's important to understand that the term Chicano, Mexican, and Latino are terms of ethnicity in reference to people's culture and heritage, and that people of all races do belong to these ethnic groups. So now that we have this understanding, let's talk about what were some of the conditions that inspired the Chicano movement um, to emerge across the Southwest. So there's quite a few conditions that created this. First is conquest of the Americas, and we're gonna define each one of these. Again, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the inconsistency of racial categorization of Mexican Americans, gaps in farm and factory workforces after World War I, limited access to education and quality education, joining the military for class mobility, war and poverty programs that were created by Lyndon B. Johnson, and police brutality constantly impacting community. So let's first begin in defining the first condition which truly inspired the origins of this movement, and that is conquest of the Americas. Conquest is defined as a practice of colonization to expand the wealth and power of Portugal and Spain, also referred to as the Iberian Peninsula in alignment with the Catholic Church. Around this historical period of time, um, this economic system of feudalism was beginning to fail. And so in its place, a system as colonialism for the economy was set into place. But what does colonization really mean? Well, in a definition informed by Roxanne Dumbar Ortiz, colonization is to establish a colony, forcing people off their land, and then exploiting those who are displaced for their labor to support and expand the wealth and power of a European country. So in summary, what came forward from this era of conquest that we still see in the impacts of our communities today? One is that during this period, land became private property and people were forcibly removed from their lands as well as being forcibly removed from their relationship with their culture. Second was white supremacy emerged to neutralize class tensions because people suddenly were not connected to their homelands, were not connected to a land at all, and forced to work for free or no cost labor. And facing the destruction around culture, um, this then allowed for the concept of race to emerge as an identity that people then could access rights and privileges in their society. And then lastly, something that Dubar, Roxanne Dubar Ortiz from an indigenous people's history of the United States describes is that terminal narratives also emerge from this era of conquest. And these are false narratives or alternative narratives or stories about what colonization and conquest were. Oftentimes, when we learn about Europeans coming to the Americas, we are told that Europeans brought disease with them, and this is what wiped out indigenous peoples. While yes, disease was a factor in what caused death to indigenous peoples, across the Americas, as well as the death of many African people who were enslaved and transported on ships through the transatlantic slave trade. To say that this was the main cause of death of indigenous peoples is in fact a lie. But the declined indigenous um, population is really attributed to how central violence is to the effectiveness of colonization. As Roxanne Dumbar Ortiz articulates in her research, she shares that nearly all of the population areas of the Americas were reduced by 90% following the onset of colonizing projects, decreasing the targeted indigenous populations of the Americas from 100 million to 10 million. And this is to cover up once again how central violence was and still is to the culture of conquest. Essentially, this is to bury how genocide, war, pillaging, and many other forms of violence were central to the success of colonization and conquest of the Americas for European countries to gain more land and more power. So this is important to keep in mind because it greatly informs the experience 
of Mexican Americans and Chicanos in inspiring this movement and how they unified around a shared identity. The next component of history I want to uplift is again around the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. As I mentioned earlier, this treaty was set into place on February 2nd of 1848. And this was proposed by Mexican Congress um, with Mexico accepting that the Rio Grande River as the border of Texas and ceding almost half of its territory, which incorporates present day states of California, New Mexico, Nevada, parts of Colorado, Arizona, Utah, and even Oklahoma, then were adopted into the United States in return for only $15 million. This was again prepared by Mexican Congress at the conclusion of the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1848. And this is essentially the geographic area that is now referred to as the Southwest region of the US. So we can see an image of here what um, original territory was acquired from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. In Articles 8, 9, and 10 specifically this of the treaty, this referred to the rights of Mexicans in this occupied territory. In Article 9 of the treaty, this granted Mexicans the enjoyment of all rights of citizens of the United States according to the enjoyment of the principles of the Constitution and in the meantime shall be maintained and protected in the free enjoyment of their liberty and property and secured to free exercise of their religion without restriction. And this is from um, the research of Rodolfo Acuna in his work titled Occupied Amer America, A History of Chicanos. Essentially the summary of what resulted from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was these three central components. Mexicans became US citizens. They were um, supposedly um, ensured of their land rights, both individually and communally. And their, also their, their freedom of religion was protected. And it's important around this component of religion because Catholicism was um, and continues to be very central to many of, of whose culture, um, much of Mexican American culture and Mexican culture and this was different coming into a Protestant, predominantly Protestant state. So a common saying that you will hear from many Mexican Americans and Chicanos, many of, uh, throughout the Southwest, is that the border crossed us, which is in fact true because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. But in this, there was also other things that emerged um, that created some of these conditions and tensions um, for the Chicano movement. And one of those components is that there was an inconsistency by the US government of a racial categorization of Mexican Americans. This inconsistency actually can be derived from the time of conquest, um, first around the system of la casta. This um, term, la casta, directly translates from Spanish into English as lineage. And it was a system of racial classification created by the Spanish and then implemented into laws and institutions across the Americas, as well as other areas that are considered to be the Southwest region of the US today. And this system determined people's social and political standing, essentially what rights and privileges they could access. And it was largely based upon um, a person's parents and their racial identities, as well as the physical characteristics of the person as well as their skin color. So the perception of this, another term to refer to that is known as colorism. And the racial classification of people through the system of La Casta then was listed oftentimes on people's baptismal certificates in the Catholic Church. What's important to note about this is that the more European features that somebody had or the lighter skin they had, the greater amount of privileges they had within a, within a society during times of conquest. And these traditions continue to be passed on to present day. That's part of what we see within Chicanismo as well as Latinidad in our culture is, is this praise of being in proximity to whiteness. However, this is something that is, um, that created, again, 
a systemic racism to be ingrained into part of institutions and how they operate. So when the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo passed, something that's significant about the treaty is that it did not classify Mexicans in regards to race. And this is important because the experience of Mexican Americans and Chicanos is different from that of other BIPOC-led social movements where their race was never in question or their ethnic identity was not in question. And so this brings me to a series of legal cases then where Mexican Americans and their ethnicity or being Chicano was under examination and how did this relate to their experience of race. The last thing I'll say is that it's important for the US federal government to continue to classify the dominant majority to be white. And this is important in the sense of the broader agenda of having a predominantly white nation state. In that, um, what happened is essentially by default, um, once the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, is that Mexican Americans were generally classified as um, white. And there were different legal cases over time. That contested this, um, so to, to see whether or not this was true. One of the earliest cases to exist was in 1913 of Mastes versus Schoen in Alamosa, Colorado. Um, what's significant about this case, and I encourage you to, to look into each of these because I'm just going to briefly go over them. For this particular case, there was a group of parents that sued um, the school district in Alamosa saying that their children were being racially discriminated against because they were Mexican American. And the, con the school district contested saying that they were separating children based upon language access, but a series of youth spoke in English and testified on behalf of themselves in court, showing their English proficiency. And the judge ultimately ruled that the difference was actually of segregating students was actually a form of racial discrimination. And so in this time, Mexican Americans were still being classified as white, but were seen as other whites. In 1936, the League of United Citizens of Latin America, an organization originally founded in Corpus Christi, Texas in 1929, actually advocated for Mexicans to be classified as racially white. Part of the intent of this was for Mexicans to better assimilate into the US and to have their rights recognized because there continued to be discrimination and not um, recognized rights, especially of land ownership after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo for those who had resided there and the border crossed them. And as a result, the US government in 1940 actually listed Mexicans as white um, and again, this is very problematic since not all Mexicans are racially white and Mexican Americans continue to face forms of discrimination. In 1946, um, there was another legal case known as Mendez versus Westminster. And this was um, in Orange County, California, where again, a group of parents gathered together after the Mendez family had experienced discrimination of their children um, in schools. And as they band together, they um, put forward a legal case where the ruling established that the children were actually subjected to ethnic discrimination, but were racially white. And this ruling ultimately led to the desegregation of schools in the state of California. The next case that is really significant is one based in Jackson County, Texas. And that is from May 4th, 1954 of Hernandez versus Texas. Pete Hernandez with his lawyers challenged that Mexican Americans were not white and should be considered a special class since he was convicted by an all white jury and a Mexican American had not served on a jury in Jackson County in over 25 years. However, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals rejected this petition and pointed out that so far as we are advised, meaning the court, 
No member of Mexican nationality had ever challenged the classification of being racially white. Therefore, Mexican Americans after this case were considered again to be other whites in this legal classification through 1970. A significant case that then shifted things came shortly after Hernandez versus Texas and isn't solely rooted in the Chicano movement, but in the greater fight for civil rights. And that was on May 17, 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas. Oliver Brown filed a class action lawsuit against the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas in 1951 after his daughter, Linda Brown, was denied entrance into Topeka's all-white elementary schools. And in his lawsuit, Brown claimed that schools for black children were not equal to the schools for white children, and that segregation violated the so-called equal protection clause within the 14th Amendment, which holds that no state can deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So this victory around civil rights actually became fundamental to then how Mexicans were classified in this later case in 1970 of Cisneros versus Corpus, Corpus Christi, where a group of Chicano parents filed a lawsuit once again, claiming that their children were intentionally segregated by the Corpus Christi Independent School District in Texas. And the court ruled in favor of the parents stating that Mexican Americans were an identifiable minority based on physical, cultural, religious, and linguistic distinctions with a history of discrimination against them. And the significance of this is that Cisneros versus Corpus Christi was the first case to entitle Mexican, to include Mexican Americans under the decision of Brown versus the Board of Education in Topeka. And it replaced this classification of being other white um, that had previously existed in the 1950s. So Mexican Americans started to be recognized as an ethnic minority that did experience discrimination in our legal institutions. But there were other things that were also motivating the, the inspiration of the Chicano movement. And one of those was actually gaps in farm and factory workforces fo post-World War I. Post-World War I, um, from 1929 to 1939, this era is known as Mexican repatriation, where essentially the US government deported 1.2 US citizens of Mexican descent to Mexico. And this was really motivated by a certain propaganda to protect jobs for white Americans in reaction to the Great Depression. What resulted was a further shortage in workforces, however, especially in the agricultural industry and factories. As a result, later on what we see is programs emerging, including the Bracero program, which, from 19, which existed from 1942 to 1946. And this program essentially established diplomatic accords between Mexico and the United States, which permitted millions of Mexican men to work legally in the United States on short-term labor contracts, especially when it came to farm work. And this combined with other policies, such as the North American Fair Trade Agreement, also referred to as NAFTA, created a consistent stream of Mex Mexicans needing to migrate for economic stability and or survival in seeking out um, both farm and factory worker jobs. A few other contributing factors that motivated the Chicano movement to arise um, is that joining the military was one of the most accessible options and opportunities due to the inconsistencies of um, education and opportunities that people had to establish more economic stability for themselves. Additionally, because of the inconsistencies of racial classification of Mexicans well throughout until 1970, Mexicans were more easily admitted into the military because they were seen as white people. However, this was not true while many people who did serve um, continued to face discrimination because of their ethnic background. 
And while um, joining the military did allow for many Mexican family, Mexican American families to break the cycle of poverty or to establish greater economic stability, this actually primed the environment of uh, what was to come during the time of the Vietnam War, where there began to be a change in understanding of many Mexican Americans and Chicanos because they saw that their struggles that they were facing at home was interconnected with those impacted by the war in Vietnam. And during this time, popular education of the impacts of US imperialism was becoming more widespread. With the civil rights um, movement focused on the Poor People's Campaign, the emergence of the Black Panther Party of self-defense in Oakland, and other anti-war movement organizations. And Chicano leaders took notice of this kind of education. And later, the crusade for justice here in Colorado, as well as the Brown Berets of Los Angeles, California, were amongst the many local efforts that would lead the charge for Chicano men to resist against the draft for the Vietnam War, and saw the importance of a strongly aligning their movements with the anti-war movement. One of the other components that motivated the Chicano movement is the war on poverty programs that were created by Lyndon B. Johnson during his presidency to combat the 19% poverty rate. And the reason why this is significant is that many Mexican Americans and Chicanos were actually appointed to positions of leadership, where many became further charged to create greater change in their local communities because they felt limited by um, what these programs could accomplish and what they couldn't. And then lastly, but very importantly, is the persistence of police brutality, meaning public arrests, raids, surveillance, beatings, and killings, especially in predominant Mexican-American neighborhoods, also referred to as barrios, was a regular occurrence. And this persistence of violence, again, then caused local efforts to emerge, especially in part of, the, of what emerged for the crusade of justice here in Colorado. So let's talk about, now that we understand these motivations, who are some of the core leaders and organizations uh, over time? And unlike other um, sessions where I go through chronologically each step, we're actually gonna take a peek at local efforts, the history of what was shared nationally, or in reference to the Chicano movement, the history of Atzlan, which is also a term to refer to the Southwest region of the US. And then we'll end with Colorado. So we'll go through New Mexico, California, Texas, um, national, and then Colorado. So let's dig into New Mexico. New Mexico was the, the first local um, issue, the first local campaign to emerge when it comes to the history of the Chicano movement. And much of this history is not well known to many of us. In 1963, La, La Alianza Federal de Mercedes was founded by Reis Lopez de Regina, who is known as El Tigre with 6,000 Chicanos to take collective action to defend their communal land rights from being co-opted or sold to corporations in northern New Mexico. By 1964, La Alianza membership grew to 14,000 people. What's important to know about this and something you can learn more about if you um, weren't able to attend our last session is the relevancy of land grants and how that relates to the experience of Chicanos, specifically in South Colorado and Northern New Mexico. But essentially this group of people came together to defend both their individual and collective land rights. And in 1966, by October 15th, 350 members of La Alianza occupied the Echo Amphitheater in Kit Carson National Forest, where they once again were claiming their communal land rights. By October 22nd, Alianza members made a citizen's arrest and detained two rangers for trespassing. The Alianza court found, a people's court, found these two rangers guilty, but ultimately suspended the sentence. And later, 20 Alianza members entered Tierra Amarilla, again, that's in reference to the land grant, to make a citizen's arrest of the district attorney 
Alfonso Sanchez for trespassing on their claimed communal lands. This again is informed by the research of Rodolfo Acuna from his history of Chicanos in occupied America. The government then sent 400 military, police, and law enforcement with 200 military vehicles to track down Tirgina, who was arrested and charged with illegal trespassing of the national forest, along with a series of other crimes. By 1967, Tirgina was convicted of two assault charges. And in 1968, the jury ruled in the case of Tirgina that he was not guilty. But then later deny, but then this ruling was later denied by a higher court. So his trial continued to persist. La Alianza became involved in the Poor People's Campaign connected to the civil rights movement, but Tirgina advocated for Chicanos to be recognized as equals in this social movement. And in the fall of that same year, Tirgina ran for governor um, for the People's Constitution Party ticket and ultimately lost the election. But this really did continue to inspire and spur the local efforts that were happening in New Mexico. In 1969, La Alianza attempted to occupy the Carson National Forest for a second time at a campsite known as Coyote. And by 1971, Tirijina was incarcerated and held in isolation for several months. The involvement of New Mexicans continued to persist over time but what's important to really understand and learn from this history is that um, is the connection of Chicanos to land and both their individual and communal land rights. The other local effort that emerged next was in California. And this perhaps might be what is most commonly known, most popular to many of us and what we briefly learn in school. Organizing farm workers was deeply important to the fabric of the Chicano movement. Additionally, the successes of farm workers were highly motivating to Chicano youth to get involved with the movement because they saw their parents advocating for their rights and working conditions to improve their lives. So they too realized that they had the power to do the same in the ed system, education system and beyond. So let's talk about the movement in California. In 1964, the National Farm Worker Association was founded by Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, and Gil Padilla, who were all previously involved in an organization called Community Service Organization that was led by an organizer by the name of Fred Ross. In 19, it, um, by 1964, there was 1,700 members who joined um, the National Farm Worker Association by the middle of that year. By September 16th of 1965, the National Farm Worker Association joined with the Filipino farm workers involved with the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, or AWOC, for a grape strike demanding higher wages and formed what is known as the United Farm Workers, UFW. By 1966, in March 17th, there were 70 grape strikers who walked nearly 340 miles in 25 days from Delano to Sacramento, California. Hundreds joined along the way in support. Sacramento is the state capital in California. By April 10th, 10,000 people rallied when grape strikers arrived in Sacramento at the state capitol building, where they were announced, where they announced that their main target when it came to the grape strike was a grower by the name of Shekneli, and um, signed, um, and ultimately that grower signed an agreement with the National Farm Workers Association. Later in the summer, the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee voted and became affiliated with the American Federation of Labor. By 1967, the United Farm Workers Organizing Committee targeted um, Guimara Vineyards Corporation, who was one of the largest producers of table grapes. By May 13th, um, ELAC and Loyola University established United Mexican American students, 
o más. By 1968, UMAS inspired 10,000 students to walk out from five schools with a series of demands. And youth leaders and supporters then formed the Educational Issues Committee, Coordinating Committee to see the demands through. Additionally, the Brown Berets were founded by David Sanchez in Los Angeles, California. And their primary focus was to end discrimination and injustices faced by Chicano youth and meet the needs of the barrio, or urban neighborhoods where Mexican Americans lived. And this included access to food, clothes, health clinics, and so forth. By 1970, um, in June of that year, Coachella Valley grape growers agreed to sign contracts with the United Farm Workers. Victories in the San Joaquin Valley followed shortly after and other areas of California. What's important to understand about this history, while this timeline seemed maybe brief in our conversation, the commitment of these farm workers continued to really inspire people across the world and how they could better improve their working conditions and fight for their rights, as well as the young people who were inspired by their own parents or who were exercising their power and their rights. And so it's important to understand that um, while they were on strike, many of these families and the ways that these organizations sustain themselves was continuing to organize um, what we refer to now as mutual aid resources, allowing for people to continue to be on strike, to continue to fight um, without going to work. And so this is, this is with a, a lot of effort. The next um, local effort to discuss is around Texas. And um, as a Tejana, this is a history that I definitely didn't know until doing this project. In 1964, the first Chicano youth organization was founded by Jose Angel Gutierrez, who is in the previous picture, Ambrico Mendez, and Gabriel Tafoya by organizing students at Texas a and University in Kingsville, Texas. This is actually the university my parents went to. Um, and they concentrated their efforts on admission, discrimination, segregated dorms, and poor housing. And the Texas a and student group attended a convention later on that year in Austin hosted by the Political Association of Spanish-Speaking Organizations, known as PASO, where they connected with other student groups who were facing similar issues. What we see then later in 1967 is that the Mexican-American youth organization known as Mayo was formed at St. Mary's College in San Antonio, Texas. The establishment of this organization then inspired other Mayo chapters to form at schools across South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley. In 1968 through 1970, there were 36 student walkouts in Texas led primarily by Chicano youth organizations. And these walkouts were to escalate um, the neglect that Chicano students were facing in the educational system so that their demands could be met. One of these instances um, was in 1969, where in November of that year, a group of Chicano youth were excluded consistently from extracurricular activities in Crystal City, Texas. And by December, one or 1,700 students decided that they needed to walk out in order to address this issue for, for the school board of Crystal City. The school board, however, refused to address any of these acts of discrimination. And so the parents and students came together and they formed a new strategy that they would flip the school board and form their own political party. And so in 1970, what we see is the emergence of La Raza Unida Party being founded um, locally in Texas and winning four out of seven school board seats in Crystal City, along with all Chicano city councils in Carrasso Springs, Catula, and Crystal City, Texas. These are all within the Rio Grande Valley if you were to look at a map. By 1972, La Raza Unida Party increased Mexican-American voter registration uh, by over 22,388 people in Texas. 
So this local effort was strong, and this then um, inspired some of the national efforts that were coordinated. And then we'll get into Colorado because there's a lot more history there too. And this is actually a picture of um, Jose um, Angel Gutierrez, um, Tirgina from New Mexico, and Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez from Colorado, three of the core leaders of the Chicano movement at a convening for La Raza Unida Party. In 1969, one of the first national convenings was on March 23rd, and that was the National Chicano Youth Liberation Conference that was hosted here in Denver. At this conference, Chicano youth adopted what is known as El Plan Espiritual de Aslan, the spiritual plan of Aslan, which used nationalism and summarized the necessity of self-determination and liberation of Chicanos. The Chicano Council for Higher Education and El Movimiento Estudi Estudiado Chicano de Atlan, known as Mecha, um, inspired, uh, formed, and then inspired other chapters to be established at education institutions across the Southwest of the United States, as, especially in the state of California, where there was some youth organizing happening, but really it was from this convening that it encouraged more to, to spur. And by December um, 20th, the National Chicano Moratorium Committee, which included, again, leaders from the Crusade for Justice from Colorado, as well as the Brown Berets of Los Angeles and many other Brown Berets throughout the Southwest, to organize their first action with a thousand demonstrators in East Los Angeles, California. By 1970, the, in March of that year, the second National Chicano Youth Liberation Conference was hosted again in Denver. Part of this conference was used to articulate solidarity with indigenous people, further educating youth leaders on points of solidarity between common struggles, as well as acknowledging that indigenous people, American Indians, are in fact the truest stewards of the land. Additionally, La Raza Unida Party expanded to Colorado and California from this conference. And Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez, the head of the Crusade for Justice here, was appointed as the chair of La Raza Unida Party. In August uh, 29th, a national moratorium action was organized by the National Chicano Moratorium Committee, which gathered 30,000 participants from across the country in Los Angeles, California. While the action was peaceful, there was an incident with a group of youth who had, um, who had stolen a few soft drinks from a nearby liquor store. As a result, there were 1,200 police that targeted demonstrators, and this led to mass arrests as well as mass violence. What's important to understand about both of these um, actions that were led by the National Chicano Moratorium Committee is that this was a call for Chicano youth to resist against the draft and to be more politically aligned with the anti-war movement. By 1972 and September of that year, La Raza Unida Party convened for a national conference in El Paso, Texas. Richard Falcón, a leader of New Mexico, was tragically killed by a white bigot on his way to the conference, which added a somber tone to this particular gathering. And ultimately, the results of this conference led to a split within the party when Gutierrez um, from Texas defeated Gonzalez for the role of national chair. In the coming years of 1974, Colorado ultimately left the National La Raza Unida Party. And by 1977, La Raza Unida Party ended. Something to note um, is that Jose Angel Gutierrez really tried to advocate that La Raza Unida Party was not um, yet ready to expand to the, this level of being a coordinated effort to the Southwest, but that would actually be a more effective strategy if it was locally focused in the way that it was in the Rio Grande Valley when it first started. But um, with the aspirations of this time and some of the, the energy, there was a big hunger and excitement to expand the party. While ultimately, in a national coordinated way, there were not seen as um, campaign successes when it comes to the party. There was a huge amount of civic engagement that happened, a huge increase in Mexican-American voter registration, and more political involvement of Chicanos throughout the entire region. 
And that cannot go unrecognized. But let's now talk about the history here in Colorado that relates to the Chicano movement. Um, so um, this picture is actually from the archives of History Colorado, and it's related to the West um, High walkouts. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. One of the first um, events that happened that began to inspire the momentum for the crusade for justice to emerge was on July 7th of 1962, where Denver police officer Gordon L. Thomas murdered Edward Larry Romero, who was a 19-year-old Chicano. In response, mayoral candidate at the time, Thomas Kurigan, promised to create an independent review board to investigate Romero's murder. Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez, an active member at the time of the Democratic Party, was excited by the possibility of this independent board, and along with others, encouraged participation in the mayoral election uh, and supported Kurigan to be elected. However, Kurigan did not see through his promise, and this angered many in the Mexican-American community of Denver. By 1963, on March 7th, police, Denver police brutally beat Alfred Salazar, also a 19-year-old Chicano, with a nightstick and arrested him for disturbance and resisting arrest after leaving a bar called Westway in Denver's Westwood neighborhood. The bar's no longer there, but the neighborhood is. And Salazar's parents went to Gonzalez's bail bond office, which is his business at the time, to help release their son, who accompanied them to the jail. Salazar, when they, Alfred Salazar, when his parents um, encountered him, was incoherent. He was unable to sign his name, and so his parents rushed him to the Denver General Hospital, where they found that his skull was in fact fractured from the injuries he sustained from the police beating, and he died. The Denver Court Chapter, which was a civil rights, multiracial civil rights organization based here locally, as well as the Denver Luncheon Club, Committee Against Police Brutality, the United Mothers, and the American GI Forum, and Los Voluntarios, um, became involved in advocating against the heinous police brutality that a Mexican-American community was facing here in Denver. Los Voluntarios was an organization that was founded by Corky Gonzalez for Spanish-speaking Coloradans, particularly parents, to advocate for their, their youth in schools. By May 5th, a community meeting was held by Corky Gonzalez with 500 people, including city and state officials demanding an investigation of Salazar's death at the AFL-CIO headquarters. Mayor Kurigan later shot down the proposals that were put forward from community at that meeting, but the community persisted. On September 1st, 1965, Mayor Kurigan appointed Gonzalez to spearhead Denver's war on poverty efforts and served as the director of the Neighborhood Youth Corps. In 1966, on April 23rd, ooh. Sorry, missing the pages. Um, on April 23rd, Gonzalez became increasingly disillusioned with the inaction of the Democratic Party, especially regarding issues that were most prominent to the Mexican American community. By April 24th of that year, Gonzalez was fired from being the director of the Neighborhood Youth Corps. And that day, Gonzalez with his associates, there we go. Um, um, Gonzalez with his like associates as well as with a rally of, okay, let me start over. On April 24th, Gonzalez was fired from being the director of the Neighborhood Youth Corps. And that same day, Gonzalez with many others organized a rally of 1,200 people, which is the moment that is attributed as the birth of the crusade. This is a picture of Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez. He gave many speeches. Um, one of the ways that he actually shared a lot of popular education was through his speeches, both in parks here throughout Denver, as well as at the community meetings um, that were known as, as the crusade. Mm -hmm. 
By 1967, El Gallo, La Voz de la Justicia newspaper, was created by the Crusade for Justice and began to circulate. This is where um, Corky Gonzalez's infamous poem, Yo Soy Joaquin, I Am Joaquin, was first published and shared. By March 25th, did he not sent a personal invitation to Gonzalez for the crusade members to take part in the occupation of San Joaquin del Rio de Chama, set for June. During the summer of this same year, the Crusade for Justice purchased Calvary Baptist Church at 1567 Downing Street to serve as their headquarters. There were weekly social activities that were held on Fridays for Chicano youth, and this helped with fundraising efforts for the building, as well as recruitment for Chicano youth to become more involved with the crusade. A small delegation from the crusade attended the Poor People's Campaign alongside leaders from New Mexico. And after returning from the Poor People's Campaign, the crusade created a freedom school where youth learned about Chicano history, culture, and politics. This experience empowered many Chicano youth to have a sense of pride in their culture, identity, and leadership. By June 10th, um, in response to this invitation of um, Terejina to come to New Mexico, the Crusade for Justice held a rally, held a rally in solidarity with La Alianza Federal de Mercedes in their effort to defend their land rights and announced that they were sending a delegation of members to join the struggle because the Crusades saw it as interlinked with their own struggles in Denver. By June 12th, the Crusade sent a delegation to join the efforts in Tierra Amarilla, New Mexico, and were present for Tirijina's arrest. Gonzalez actually remained in New Mexico for most of July to lend his support locally. There were things that continued to happen and spur here in Denver, and one of those was on July 3rd, where Eugene Cook, a black youth, was killed by Denver police. Shortly thereafter, on Ju July 12th, Denver police killed 18-year-old Chicano Luis Pinando. And jo by July 23rd, the Denver Black Panther chapter and the Crusade for Justice marched and met at the Denver police headquarters with 300 demonstrators who demanded to the police chief that these constant violent attacks and murders end immediately. On October 6, Gonzalez wrote um, to the mayor and police chief that the community demanded that the officers involved in the deaths of Cook and Pinedo be immediately fired. In October 18th, Officer E. Kane, who was responsible for the death of Pinedo, was acquitted. The crusade rallied and community rallied the community through El Gallo newspaper on how this result was why they needed to take further action. By 1968, Chicanos for Action formed out of a Spanish club in Pueblo, Colorado. They organized their first demonstration to retain a Spanish teacher at a local school. But this teacher was unfortunately fired. And Chicanos for Action then became involved in the interview process to hire the next Spanish teacher. The Pueblo Brown Berets were founded by Martin Mari Serena with a series of other local leaders in Pueblo. And this organization continues to be active to this present day. This was one of the many chapters that had expanded across the southwestern US as well as Chicago. You can learn more about this from a lecture series on YouTube um, that is hosted by CSU Pueblo Library for the 50th anniversary of Chicano Studies on the Brown Berets of Pueblo. By 1969, on February 27th, Gonzalez called a meeting f with um, West High School principal and 20 students, parents, as well and crusade members in attendance to address how a teacher, Mr. Schaefer, was repeatedly discriminatory towards Chicano students. By March 19th, a group of West High students, including Ginny Perez, Priscilla Mendez, Agui, Boteo and Donald Archie Laforete decided to walk out of school. On March 20th, youth leaders distributed leaflets before school and called for students to walk out at 9 a.m. This started as what is referred to as the West High School walkouts or blowouts. On March 21st, the West High 
walkouts continued with 1,200 gathered outside of West High School with students from schools across the country. A series of organizations such as the Denver Black Panthers, Students for Democratic Society, and UMAS chapters from the University of Colorado Boulder and Denver also attended the demonstration. Inside the school, students and parents once again negotiated with school authorities about their demands. And school officials then proceeded to make promises such as updating the curriculum and hiring more Chicano leaders. Something that I failed to mention for the date prior is that there was a crowd of about 300 people. And by the end of the day, 25 people were arrested, including Corky Gonzalez and Nita. And, the hundred, and that night, there were hundreds of people who gathered at the Crusade headquarters for a meeting to then continue the momentum that was built on March 21st. This also escalated to violence across the entire west side of Denver and north side of Denver. Um, and there's more that you can learn about that um, in some of the sources that are included in your timeline handout. By March 23rd, the National Chicano Youth Liberation Conference was first hosted in Denver. And as we mentioned, this is where El Plan Espiritual de Atlan was established. Later in the summer, youth engaged in actions known as splashins instead of sit-ins at rundown parks in Chicano Barrios. And there were many other actors who demonstrated their solidarity, including the Denver Black Panther chapter. The North Side Black Berets were founded by Manuel Rocky Hernandez and served as security at park events and other social activities. There was a lot of activity, again, that happened in parks that were crucial to Chicano neighborhoods um, to involve more people and to expand political education of what was going on with the crusade. By September 16th, the crusade called for a mass walkout after Chicano youth selected this date at the National Youth Conference earlier that year. With a focus on Chicano community's concern about the education system, there were 2,000 to 4,500 demonstrators that participated, and the majority were students. The protest was successful, where the state government actually granted $100,000 of funding to be committed to West Side Schools. By fall of this year, there were also 20 Chicano teachers who were hired who previously could not have even obtained an interview. The Eastside Brown Berets were founded by Rory Mierra, Margarito Mugsy Barrososa, and Ray Zarazagosa. Their membership primarily consisted of middle and high school students who had dropped out of school. By October 7th, there were 10 Black Beret members who um, 10 Black Beret members that were informed that they could no longer wear their berets at school, at North High School, or they would be subject to suspension. When the founder of the Black Berets, Hernandez, confronted school officials as to why Black Beret members were suspended, um, they later refused to answer any of his questions, and so he returned to class. Later that day, however, three police officers were sent to arrest Hernandez in class and dragged him out of the building. Hernandez was then detained with a bond set at $1,000 for disturbance and unlawful acts in school. The impacts of this um, event really inspired, again, youth to organize and to come together to take action. And in the following year of 1970, by February 11th, the Black Berets with the Eastside Brown Berets, West High School students, and youth leaders from the Crusade for Justice organized another walkout. In March of that year, the Eastside Brown Berets membership grew to 200 people, and the second National Chicano Youth Liberation Conference was hosted here in Denver. Again, this is the conference that expanded La Raza Unida Party to Colorado and California and demonstrated solidarity with the American Indian Movement. By May of this year, the first meeting for La Raza Unida Party Colorado was held in Pueblo, Colorado, where it continued to be headquartered. And Gonzalez spoke at the meeting, emphasizing how the party would wield Chicano power. And later that year, Al Albert Grule of Pueblo and George Garcia of Denver ran for governor and lieutenant governor through the party. 
And although they did not win the election, this again created more momentum to involve more Chicanos in the Crusade for Justice efforts statewide. During the summer, the Crusade for Justice once again hosted a youth liberation school, and at this time, the enrollment had doubled. By September 16th, the Crusade continued to hold a annual peaceful mass action walkout, and this was in honor of Mexican Independence Day, also referred to as Chicano Liberation Day, and this was supported with the Black Berets, Brown Berets, the Denver and Boulder UMAS chapters, and the Colorado Migrant Council, the West Side Youth Center, the Hispano Youth Congress, and the West Side Health Board, and the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, along with many others. After um, this event, later in September, Escuela Tataloco was opened at the Crusade headquarters on 1567 Downing Street. And this name was decided on to honor the hundreds of students who were massacred in the Tlateloco Plaza in Mexico City in 1968. The students, the school initially served youth from the crusade and Chicano youth who were kicked out of public schools or who had problems within juvenile courts. Sustaining the school became one of the major areas of focus for the crusade and multiple court organizers became educators at the school. Escuela Tataloco remained open for 46 years and served as a training ground for many young activists. By 1972, the crusade demonstrated solidarity with the American Indian Movement with the national caravan that was happening as part of the Trail of Broken Treaties, which led to the occupation of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington, D.C. in November. The crusade then moved headquarters to the Downing Terrence apartment complex. In 1973, on March 6th, the crusade held a march on Colfax Avenue in solidarity with the Ogallala Nation and American Indian leaders leading the occupation at Wounded Knee. Shortly after this um, is re commonly referred to as the March Confrontation that started on March 16th, there was a party happening close to the crusade headquarters and the police were surveilling the area as they commonly did. A Chicano, a young Chicano named um, Marquenet Mascarnenas argued with a driver of a passing police off patrol car and was ordered into the car. When Luis Martinez, a member of the Black Berets and a popular youth leader of the crusade, along with Ernesto Virgil, Mario Vasquez, and other youth inquired about why Mascarenas was detained, Patrolman Steve Snyder claimed it was because of jaywalking. Things violently escalated when Snyder opened the patrol car and hit Martinez in the groin. Although Martinez attempted to de-escalate the situation and leave, Snyder chased after him. Witnesses heard five gunshots and shortly after, Martinez was found dead. What is referred, this is referred to once again as the March 17th confrontation, and the police continued to attack the Chicano community well into the early hours of that morning. There was a shootout that led to the explosion of the Downing Terrence apartment complex. It was later confirmed on April 1st that 58 people were arrested from this confrontation, and the reported number of police totaled to 200 officers. It's important to uplift this because the surveillance of all social justice movements was very intense. Um, and the experience of surveillance um, that happened specifically to the crusade was, was very extensive and excruciating. You can learn a lot more about that in um, a book um, known as um, The Crusade for Justice, written by um, Ernesto Vigil which accounts for even more of this history. By March 18th, the crusade hosted a press conference criticizing the police department for attacking their community. And on March 21st, Luis Martinez's funeral was hosted at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church here in Denver with over 2,000 people in attendance. He was later buried in New Mexico and a caravan of supporters, including crusade members, went um, to support with his burial and his family. 
And again, the surveillance that was um, bombarding the crusade at this time was very prominent. And from November to mid-December of this same year, there were 12 people involved with various organizations of Colorado Chicano movement organizations where they faced a total of 15 different court appearances. And um, this then really pivoted a lot of crusade resources to be supporting those who were in these legal proceedings, again, due to so much of the surveillance that was happening of Chicano organizations. By 1974, and January 13th, a homemade bomb was tossed through the window of a paint store owned by James A. Bone, the same owner of the Down Downing Terrace apartments. Two days later, the Rocky Mountain News reported on the incident, not naming any specific suspects, but making ties to the crusade or alluding to ties to the crusade of this event. On January 16th, the crusade hosted a press conference to announce a $10 million lawsuit against the owners of the Rocky Mountain News for false reporting. And Gary Garrison, a member of the crusade, was arrested for the bombing of the paint store just hours after. By January 24th of the same year, Garrison was scheduled to testify before a grand jury in Denver. But he was dismissed before giving testimony and was given and he was arrested and set with a bond for fifty thousand dollars. By May twenty seventh and twenty ninth, there were two separate bombing explosions that killed six activists in Boulder, Colorado. And the six are commonly referred to as Los Seis de Boulder. And this is an image of those of Los Seis de Boulder, who included Reyes Martinez. Neva Romero, Una Jackalo, Luis Martinez's girlfriend, Florencio Freddy Granado, Enberto Teran, and Francisco Dowry. The only survivor of the bombings was Antonio Alcantar, who had to have his left leg amputated as a result and suffered from immense trauma afterwards. Authorities investigated, so called investigated, these events but also speculated that these bombings were potentially the fault of those who were involved. Activists denounced these allegations and saw this as a media ploy to shed the Chicano movement and supporters in a negative light. Support was expressed from organizations across the country, seeing this violent event in Boulder as a potential means for authorities to hamper down with greater repression to those involved in social justice movements. Many were subpoenaed as part of this investigation, including three of the wives of those who were killed and ordered to appear in court before a jury. The crusade interjected when this happened and continued to back Los Seis de Boulder and their families, as well as those who they felt were unjustly subpoenaed. By August 20th through September 16th, there were 20 people who had six court appearances across the Front Range of Colorado and were affiliated with the Chicano movement. This is again to emphasize how much repression was happening um, here locally. And by September 16th of the, of the same year, Garrison's um, trial began in Denver. The reporting by the Rocky Mountain News once again included evidence to be used in trial. So his lawyers asked for a mistrial and dismissal of charges, since this would make the jury impossible to be impartial. Judge Lilly did declare a mistrial, and this was a victory for the crusade at the time. By 1974, the Co Colorado had left La Raza Unida party. In 1975, from August 13th through 29th, Garrison's case went to trial before Judge Wayno Johnson in Fort Morgan, Colorado. The crusade organized for supporters to attend and greatly contributed to the defense effort. No witnesses could confirm Garrison's presence at the crime scene of the bombing of the paint store, and the jury ultimately ruled that Garrison was not guilty. And this, again, was a huge victory for the crusade um, and animated their leaders to continue to fight. By 1976, La Cucaracha newspaper was started by Juan and Deborah Espinosa and David Martinez who were previously students at the University of Colorado Boulder and establishing this newspaper in Pueblo, Colorado. Their newspaper continued to circulate 
um, through um, 1983. And as we mentioned in our last session, they greatly lended to the local efforts that were happening to the San Luis land rights struggle and supporting them to create popular education materials and newspapers for their local community, as well as the Western Slope. Although the crusade for justice remained active throughout the late 70s, there were no distinguishable wins that invigorated the Chicano community in the same way that the 1969 walkouts had inspired. Membership began to dwindle. Many resources went towards sustaining the organization, especially Escuela Tataloco, and defending several crusaders who were caught up in legal battles due to the intensive FBI repression that, uh, and surveillance that the crusade faced. The crusade as a nonprofit, as well as Gonzalez as the leader, also faced financial, financial backlash when they would take on more radical stances of support. While the Crusade and Gonzalez did not concede on their political stances, the financial impacts also made the upkeep of programming more strenuous as well as limited the Crusade's ability to expand. Like other movements, the growing number of Chicanos emerged into the middle class, also created a political shift. And Chicanos then sought to accomplish social issues through traditional systems rather than pursuing alternative and more innovative methods. But now I've talked extensively around this history, and so um, just want to quickly summarize that there are key strategies and actions we can learn from um, all of these efforts. One is that local issue campaigns were effective at base building. Speaking to something that related to people's history and their identity is what inspired them to get involved. Popular education was crucial to all of these different efforts, whether that was lectures, newspapers circulating, and including art within the movement. Art that is visual, art through murals, art through poetry, as well as popular theater. These were ways that people began to understand their culture and the stories of the situations at hand and how they could have collective power. There was clear strategic escalation if you look at each of these local efforts, how they would build over time around set of, a set of targets, whether you're looking at the crusade for justice and how they would respond to holding the police and mayor accountable for promises that they made, or if you look at the farm workers movement and how they continue to escalate their strategies in the grape strike. Public actions and, and demonstrations were central, um, utilizing walkouts, utilizing marches that spanned long, um, or long geographic spaces were really important because it allowed for there to be greater media attention to the issues that people were experiencing, as well as calling attention to the demands if people felt unheard. There were conferences um, that were crucial, again, for youth, as well as the Raza Unida Party. And there was civic engagement that was continual and central to this effort. This included voter registration. This included locally in Texas flipping local school boards and city councils to have candidates in, in favor of their, the issues that were most important and reflective of their community. And nationally, running local candidates in different states, involving more and more Mexican Americans and Chicanos into the political process. At this point, I would love to invite our panelists to join us. First, we have Nita Gonzalez, who is the principal of Nuevo Amanecer LLC in Denver, Colorado. She is highly regarded community member, educator, nationally recognized for her leadership in education, environmental advocacy, health initiatives, and community justice and equality. Her lifelong dedication has revolved around empowering communities of color, fostering health and advancing political engagement, promoting educational opportunities and advocating for climate solutions. Nita has consistently worked towards policy reform, amplifying the vo voices of those most affected by injustices and forging stronger connections between environmental organizations, organizations of color and various stakeholders, including government and community-based organizations. 
She currently serves on the boards of Regis University, the Four Winds, American Indian Council, and the Urban Farm. Nita Gonzalez's story is one of unwavering commitment. As a political activist, community organizer, school principal, and public housing officer, she has established herself as a fearless advocate. In 1969, during the West Side blow up, protests demanding more Chicano representation at West High School in Denver, Nita fierce, fearlessly confronted police and was even arrested. Her proudest achievement is Escuela Tata Loco, a community school that emerged from the Chicano movement and her father's crusade for justice organization in 1970. The school provided a haven for students, primarily Chicanos, who had either dropped out of public schools or felt out of place in the education system. As the oldest of eight children, she emerged strong-willed and independent, inheriting her father's determination and resilience. She views her advocacy work as a natural continuation of her upbringing, organizing, agitating, activating, and speaking out. She continues to live in the north side of Denver, is a mother of two adult children and a cherished grandson. With that, let's welcome Nita Gonzalez. Um, we also have with us today Deborah Montoya. Deborah is an accomplished veteran high school social studies teacher with an extensive expertise in educational theory, methodology, and application. She has a strong content knowledge base in all social science disciplines with an emphasis in language, culture, and cultural literacy. She is a child of the Chicano civil rights movement, which has informed every other part of her community and professional life. The struggle for equality and basic human rights has made her a seed planter for change and newness and given her an astute understanding of the historic and generational trauma we carry. Her activism includes starting with the 1969 Denver High School walkouts, Su Teatro Chicana, Chicano Guerrilla <laughs> Theater, a member of the Crusade for Justice, teacher at Escuela Tataloco, and layout design for El Gallo newspaper. Mecha chairperson and organizer of the first Mecha conference in 1979. Co-founder of Danzantes of Color Aslan Grupo Tlatloc, an initiator of first Siblanta Summer Solstice Ceremony. In 1980, an ongoing practice of indigenous ceremony and ritual from each land. She continues her activism today with Capuli Color Aslan Danza Azteca and is the sixth son Cal Calmeca project of higher learning and ancestral knowledge. She is a mother and a grandmother and still lives in her lifelong community of the east side of Denver. Let's welcome up Deborah. <laughs> Lastly, we invited Teresa Trujillo from Pueblo, Colorado to be with us today. Unfortunately, she is sick, but I still wanted to share a little bit about her. Teresa is a community organizer with decades of experience in facilitation, deepening community engagement, and campaign management from Pueblo, Colorado. She understands that community organizing is something that we build and create. It does not just magically happen. She relies on the power of storytelling and relationship building as a means of transformation. Teresa's passion for power building within marginalized communities has given her um, an, a way to engage dis, in a disciplined strategic practice in building democratic and collective power and to assure conditions in which community can thrive. Her activism is rooted in her local community, the Chicano movement, which she was brought up in, and she has deeply appreciates the unique opportunity to organize in the community where she was born and raised. Even though she's not here, I would like to give her a round of applause.
Mm-hmm. All right. All right, well, I've been talking forever, it feels like, so now I hope that we can learn and be in conversation with each other. Um, I'd love to start with a question for you, Anita. Um, what do you hope people learn from the Crusade for Justice and the legacy of your father, Corky Gonzalez? Well, well, it's important before I speak that I always am grateful and thankful for the opportunity to be here humbled by you and the work that you're doing and thank you for coming out. But more importantly, I always thank our ancestors, my mother, my father, my abuelas, my abuelos, because I would not be here without them. And for all those justice warriors that stood up so that we could stand up, we stand on their shoulders, so I'm grateful for that. So what would my father, well, he, he never changed in all of his years. He was a man of very, um, um, he had integrity and he was very direct. He also believed in action. He disliked people who complained. I'm sure you hear them in the coffee shop, at a restaurant, um, you know, in, in community about how unjust the world is, which it is, how un in how in inequality and hum inhumanity are in this world. And we look like we're, we're back where we used to be, right? That we think we haven't made the gains we think we should have made by this time, given the blood that was shed and the marches that were held. And he would challenge you to say, well, then act. So stand up, speak out, don't be fearful. And that's what I learned from him is that I always will participate and organize for people to stand up. Uh, it's wonderful that we can elect um, brown men and women to offices that might be pro progressive in their politics, which is part of that work, but they can't do that work unless people stand up in the street. Mm -hmm. It is about people power, not political power. And that's what he would say. It's about you determining your destination for you, your family, our community. And it is also about we're responsible for each other. And I wanna make one thing known. We did do marches, we did do rallies, we still do. We still do, I helped organize the 150,000 migrant march. It came out of Escuela Tlatelolco, right there on Federal and 29th. But what we made very clear is we were intergenerational, it wasn't, a, it was a lot of youth, but that's because we had big families. But grandmas, grandpas, tios, tias, and Deborah knows this, aunts, uncles, we called everyone aunt and uncle that were older than us. We were familia, and we marched as familia. That's the lesson we also need to learn. It isn't about just you getting in the street because they're bold, mm -hmm. because they will. Mm -hmm. It is about us as parents and grandparents. I'll march. If young people ask me, I don't say, I don't say no. I'm not afraid to say no. I've been arrested a number of times. I've won all my cases. I told my students at Escuela Tlatelolco, that's my community service, mm -hmm. giving back to my community, standing up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Deborah, my next question is for you, and also if you wanna just say a word, you know, to the space, but, um, I'm so curious, you know, what inspired you to first be involved with the Crusade for Justice as a young person, and what continued to keep you engaged in the Crusade um, and all the other Chicano organizations which you were such a prominent leader with? All right. um, thank you all for uh, um, inviting me here tonight. I'm honored to sit next to uh, one of my mentors and one of my teachers, Nita uh, Gonzalez. Um, you, you know, uh, I loved your mom and daddy very much. I learned a lot from them. Um, but I, I actually brought my ancestors with me. 
so I'm going to put them up here. So I got the questions from Celeste this morning, and she says, what inspired you? Well, what inspired what inspired me? This is uh, this is old man Jerry Rodriguez, okay, um, Gerardo Rodriguez. Uh, he died in 1994. Um, he lived across the street from me, and uh, he was the one who gathered all of us on the east side because I I didn't have the privilege of going to Escuela, Escuela Tlatelolco to that school. I stayed in public school. Um, but Jerry is the one uh, who, who gathered all of us. And from the east side of Denver, we blew out from even the Catholic schools. Um, I went to Catholic school at that time, Sacred Heart Catholic School. My, my younger sister, Felicita, was in the first grade. She was six years old. And I took her by the hand. I went into the school. I took her by the hand, and she walked out, blew out with me. Uh, we all blew out from every school. And uh, all I remember is that Jerry was always there, and he was in the front, and we all followed him. Um, I was very, very young. These are my parents, yeah? And this is the only picture I have of them when they were young. They were at Lakeside. You, you know, I, I don't know if you see, see, they had all them babies. They actually only had three daughters. Um, but, but that's where they were, and, and I bring them as well, to, again, to remember the shoulders that we all stood on. It's kind of surprising to me sometimes uh, how many people forget um, that none of us did this alone, not, not even close. Um, we, we have hundreds and even thousands of years. Um, we can go all the way back to Guatemoxin, right? And, and there's a play going on this weekend about him. I, uh, if you get a chance, go see it. Um, back to him and the, and the mandate or the contracto that he created uh, for the people, what we were supposed to do, the instructions that he gave to us for the time that would come when we would need to rise and that our sun would rise again. So she said, the question was, who inspired? Yeah, And I'm not really sure. I thought about it a lot all day. I'm not really sure if it was a matter of inspiration. I mean, yes, we were inspired, but it was more a matter of necessity. We, we just did. Uh, there was a, an understanding that there was something very, very wrong going on in our society where our people were concerned. Uh, those of us who, you know, who became Chicano, we became Chicanos, right? And, and we started out as Mexican Americans. I, 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 I guess sometimes I still don't know who we were, right? Um, but but now I know who we are now. Now we call ourselves, you know, among the indigenous nations. Uh, uh, we call ourselves among the indigenous nations, Chicano with the next, and that connects us to our indigenous selves in this place called Itza Chilatlan, right? um, which means extended, tori, with very extended territory with very many people in it, and that's who we are now. We understand that. Um, <clears throat> I brought notes because I'm a high school teacher. So probably the, one of the most important things where I was concerned is I was born in 1957, right? I was a baby when all of this started. I was a little kid. I was 12 years old when, when Jerry grabbed all of us and took us marching downtown. And we marched in the thousands, you know, not in the hundreds or the tens or the few politicos that went out there. We were, we were marching in the thousands. Um, and I was very young, so I had the opportunity not only uh, to be there, but because I was so young, I observed a lot, right? And I saw uh, all the good, but I also saw a lot of the negative that went on, right? Um, and, and that was important to me. And so I guess I, I under, you've done a beautiful history. I read all of your work uh, just over the last week since you sent me your work. I, I read it all. There's the history. Yeah, you got it all. But what you have here is, look at me and my, my, uh, uh, my comadre. Um, aquí estamos. Estamos vivos. We're alive. We have information in our heads. A lot of information. I got so much information in my head, I actually had to make an effort to get out and share. Because I was scared to death I was going to be on my deathbed thinking, why did I never share? And so, I, so I've, I've managed with the help of, of my community to come out um, with, with some of my youngsters who have given me support and love uh, to come out and to be able to, uh, to not be silent, 
Yeah, at this age, at this age. But I was very young. Um, so then what, uh, the movement, national events. I was a little tiny kid watching it on TV. Uh, first, uh, the, uh, the first Kennedy who was assassinated, and then when Martin Luther King was assassinated, and then when JFK was assassinated, and at the same time we had the Vietnam War, and, uh, and there was just so many things going on, right? Not, not to mention the ones who had come back from World War II, and at that time uh, were, down, were met with signs on Spear and, and Larmer. My dad used to talk about it all the time, the signs on Spear and Larmer that said, no dogs and Mexicans allowed. Right, so then those veteranos, right, and what they did, and then through the the Vietnam War, I don't even think people realized that a lot of our young men who were forced to go over there came back uh, uh, debilitated uh, by heroin addiction, right? totally debilitated, and it wasn't just them. They passed it to their wives, they passed it to their nieces and nephews, they passed it to their cousins. We saw one of the things I got to see firsthand was the death of all of my, my, my youth companions, right? And that was really, really hard to take. But, okay, so I say, so we've done a lot with the history in the past, but here we are, we're alive, and, we, and I want you to know the things, not just more history, I'm a history teacher, this all I ever do is talk history, right? Um, but, but, um, but ask us about, ask us about uh, what we know to go into the future, not just what we did in the past. You know, I mean, there's so many histories written. They say that, that there have been more books written about uh, indigenous people of Ishachilatlan than any other topic in the world ever, right? Um, um, and, and, and yet, uh, we don't get close enough to that. What, what, what were the obstacles that we, that we went through? What were the bottlenecks? that we went through, right? Uh, what were the things that we tripped over, right? What did we do wrong? What could we have done better? What could we have done differently, right? Because um, uh, that's what we really need to know now. And, and one of the things that I have noticed, and, and you'll have to stop me because I will go on and on, um, but one of the things that, uh, that was really important to me um, at, about these things is that what I've noticed, especially in the last 10 years or so, um, we've had people come, yeah, and, and, and they, they do this. There's the elders, and then the elders, which are the young elders, and then there's the children, yeah? And what they do is they take the elders and they connect us with the children. They want the children to learn from us. So all the little ones are all gonna learn from osmosis of what we know, right? <laughs> It's just going to fall into their heads, and they're going to know everything. And then all the 30 and 40-year-olds go off by themselves and teach each other, right? And they forget about the elders that, are, that have this knowledge, right? What did we do wrong? Where did we go wrong, right? Where did, where did we miss out, yeah? Uh, uh, why did everything just disappear in, 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 in such a way? So I'm going to tell you the things I did call. Me and Celeste had a long conversation. I told her, I'm the one that nobody wants to invite because I'm going to give you the other side of the story. And then I asked her, are you after we finished talking, I said, are you sure you want me on your panel? And she said, yes. So it's like, okay then, right? Um, so aquí estamos, right? So this is what I saw near the end of the movement. Keeping in mind, I was very young at the, when I did come in. I graduated from West High School in 1975. When I came of age, the first thing I did, one of the first things I did was I learned to play the guitar because my dad bought me for graduation a guitar. And then I joined Su Teatro, guerrilla theater. Yeah, and, uh, and I learned to play the guitar. And that's how I learned my Spanish, because remember, a lot of us, maybe even here, that was taken from us, right? And, and then I became a teacher and found all the, the gringa uh, teachers teaching all the bilingual classes and all the Chicanas teaching the English classes because none of us knew how to speak Spanish. And then, oh, that's a whole other story. But anyway, uh, this is what I saw. And I don't mean to offend anyone, but I'm sure I will. The, at the end of the movement, the movement started eating itself. Um, there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of hatred. 
um, the, the socialists hated the communists, who hated the nationalists, who hated that organizations weren't talking to each other. Um, there were a lot of bullies. Right? And I take responsibility because there were times I stepped into that bully role. And I was good at it. We got good at it. We were militant. We had to be. Right? Again, it wasn't a matter of inspiration. It was a matter of necessity. We had no choice. We had to move. And we had to move quickly. And a lot, there wasn't a lot of thinking about it. In the early days, we were quite united, united strong. Um, but again, at the end of the movement, for some reason, everything started getting really funny and real ugly. Right? And we began to hurt each other. Bullies, the ones today I call tiny tyrants and petty dictators. Right? That, and, and we still see them today. You'll see them. You know you're going to see them. Some of you already seen them. I see heads going, yeah, I know them. Yeah? And they still exist. Those, uh, um, and, and, and they're not called out. Right? We don't call them out. We didn't call anybody out back then. Um, we were expected to be silent. Yeah? Um, one of the things that we learned in the movement, so again, I'm going to go here. One of the things that we learned was that we don't hang our dirty laundry out for everybody else to see, especially the gringos, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that still applies in some ways at times today. But what that became was just an excuse to never talk about the things that were going bad and were going wrong. Right? So we just held it all in and said, oh no, we're never gonna talk about those things. So we found ourselves in silence, right? In silence within our own movement, not good. Um, so then, uh, what are other things that, that are going on to, what, what, what types of propaganda? False equalizing. Very important that we think about that. It's a form of propaganda. False equalizing, right? You stepped, I stepped on your toe and you punched out my teeth. Okay, we're equal. No, we're not. When I punch out your teeth and you step on my toe, okay, then we're equal, right? But, but we can't be equal like that. Right? And we can't make excuses of why it's okay to abuse one another in our movement, in our movements, right? Um, and, it, it, and we don't get to, uh, again, it keeps us in silence, yeah? Um, and so then I, I have a, um, a few things, and so I'm, uh, quickly I'm gonna say to you about silence when I brought my notes. I'm not gonna say it, I'm just gonna read you the quotes that are out there because there's so many brilliant people that have already said all these things, yeah? Um, a ver si puedo, I have such a hard time with these stupid little machines. Okay. I don't even know where it's at, let me start. Martin Luther King said this, we're talking about silence. Mm -hmm. He said, I will not remember the words of my enemies. I will not remember the criticism of my enemies, but I will remember the silence of my friends. So how many times do, do any one of us, but I recall, right, when, when someone spoke up that everybody stayed silent. We never said a word. Turn the other cheek, yeah, let them slap you again. And that, that's not indigenous way, that's gringeria. That's, that's Christian church way, right? Um, that's not our way. Oh man, I got Uber Eats. But I got Uber Eats, but I don't have my quotes. And then here's another one uh, from Martin Luther King. And this is something we need to be very thoughtful of, and we don't want to be, right? So, so he says, uh, see if I could see it, see it all, because I don't know now it went somewhere. Oh, there it is. This is Martin Luther King. There are Negroes, and keep in mind that was a word that was used appropriately for them at that time. This is the early 60s. There are Negroes who will never fight for freedom, who seek profit for themselves alone from the struggle, even some who will go over to the other side. Every minority and every people has its share of opportunists, traitors, freeloaders, and escapists. The hammer blows of discrimination, poverty, and segregation must warp and corrupt some. No one can pretend that because a people may be oppressed, that every individual member is virtuous and worthy. So we have to be thoughtful of that, right? Not everybody is here to help. 
Some people come in only for the purpose of being destructive. And they are destructive. Sometimes we're destructive unto our own selves. Um, and they, uh, this is my own quote of me. Hey. Uh, the only thing worse than a corrupt leader, and we all know this because we've been living it, is a blind follower. If you follow blindly, if I pers that's how I am personally. If I know people who simply follow blindly, then I'm going to question your integrity. I'm going to question that quickly, right? Um, there was a, a, a man, and so this is the part that becomes important. What is it that we need to do, right? A man, indigenous man from uh, a Nahuali, right, of, of the Mexica nation in Mexico, Tenochtitlan, se llama Cacamatzin, yeah? And what he said is that what makes us different from all other creatures is that we can speak. So then why are we silent? Why are we afraid to speak? Um, he says, how can we fix anything? How can we make anything better if we cannot talk to each other? So that platica is very, very, very important to us, even more so now, even more so now. Um, and to listen here to these minds that, because we're still here, I'm not dead. Nita's not dead, we're not dead, we're still here. So ask us questions. Ask us what we know, ask us what we remember, right? Ask us about the things that went wrong. Ask us about the obstacles that went on. And not just simply, we're not dre window dressing. I've had youngsters just in the last five years, oh, tia, please come, please come. Even give me pretty close to where. But then when I wanna say something political, I can say all the, you know, indigenous, beautiful, uh, como dice, quali, tlatoli, uh, quali, quali, tlatoli, all the beautiful words, right? But when I want to get political, why do I want to get political? Because I was raised that way. I was born into it by necessity, right? So, so I, have to, I have to say that, right? I have to speak politically. And what I've had and what I've seen is I've been attacked by especially young women who tell me, I don't want to hear what you got to say, right? Just look pretty. Just sit there and don't say nothing. I'll even give you a little money if you shut up. <laughs> and I'm not going to shut up. Any of you who know me now, I'm not going to shut up. I refuse to be silent, especially within my own community, right? About the things that went wrong, about the things that harmed us, right? And how can we do better? And what can we do differently? This is important, right? Um, that was question number one. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you so much for all of that. And for both of you, like, I really feel like in part of this history, you know, like as a Chicana, like this is my history too. And, and learning this, like being invited to even be a steward of, of this research, it like put together stories of like my grandmother who's still alive, who keeps telling me these stories, right? Of like, her involvement in some of these like war and poverty programs and leading Head Start and uh, you know Falfurias, Texas along the border and like the impact that that continues to have right um, and that necessity that necessity still exists for so many of our gente and um, yeah I just I feel compelled uh, given like the last bit of time that we have um, I'd love to take you know a question or two from the audience that you all have. Um, for Nita and, and Deborah. So does anyone have a question here in the room? Yeah. Uh, thank you, appreciate it, and I'm, I'm excited. Um, so I, I, it's kind of like a two-part question. One, when, you, when we talk about learning from the elders, I heard from a family member of mine who was really engaged in the Chicano movement. He said part of what killed the Chicano movement as they started giving us jobs, he said. Um, and what I've noticed in, in some of my work is like working with, trying to work with the folks that got those jobs, trying to challenge them as they're now a part of that kind of like system that we're trying to shift from the ground up um, starts, to become, starts to become a struggle. That's number one. Number two is, you know, I went to a couple of the, the marches during the BLM 
um, time. And I looked around and I saw people funding and like marching in there that I know and I saw kind of in behind closed doors, like actively trying to go against the things that were trying that were being said. So like it seemed like a lot of the marches and things became co-opted to where people like lost trust in them in some of these historical ways by which we got things done. Um, those are connected in a way that I can't necessarily articulate well now, but I'm just curious as to your take on both of those things. Yeah, this reminds me quite a bit of, in the first session, we talked about the reason why we're reviewing this history is because what's happened is what's happening, you know? Um, but I'll, I'll let them speak to that. Well, first of all, I have a, a different perspective, but that's because um, I operate in a different sphere, I guess. Uh, to me, the movement didn't end. The movement wasn't brick and mortar. It wasn't the building on, on uh, Downing. It wasn't Escuela 29th in Spear. The movement was a philosophy. It was a, 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 a way of life. We, we were raised in a way of life. And the other way of life that our friends were part of, or I, I had friends part of, I didn't even understand half the time because I wasn't raised that way. But what I do believe is what was the movement for? That's the question. What was the struggle in the movement for? For us to be continue to be downtrodden? For us to continue not to be able to take care of family? No, that wasn't. The movement. The movement was for us to have dignity, to have our own destiny, to be able to have our own voice, to be able to stand up, to, yes, to be able to take and be treated equitably when it came to housing and jobs. Damn right, that's what the movement was about. It was born out of injustice, inequity, inhumanity. It was about humanity. It was also, as Deborah said, Finding our indigenous self. Chicano meant two things to us. And I'm Chicana. I am indigenous. I'm mestiza. I accept that. I honor that. I respect that. And I'm politically, consciously progressive. And I'm going to take issues on. That's how I grew up. So in answer to that, in my mind, the movement didn't die. Do you know why it didn't die? Because we renamed Columbus Park to La Raza Park 50 years later. So the movement did not die. That was a daughter of the movement as a city councilwoman that did that. Does that make her always right? No, and I make sure she knows she's not always right. Don't get lost over there. My niece is councilwoman at large, Serena Gonzalez Gutierrez. Oh, auntie and her have conversations all the time. Don't get lost, like you said come out here and be that way and then in the back, stab in the back. Uh-uh, you're not doing that. That's the other part of the movement, accountability. Accountability, and that's what Deborah's talking about. When you're not silent, you're holding accountability. Mm -hmm. You're holding accountability. But I don't speak or use my voice to make, I, I don't want to spend time in, in going over what you did, it's like a kid. If, I, if you're gonna beat them up all the time about what they didn't do, right, right? You all went through that. You turn it off after a while. So what I wanna do is find out what can you do right? What can you do right? And if you can't do right for our community, then don't do anything. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Because if you don't, I'm gonna be real clear with you. And it's not gonna be pretty. So. The, so for me, when we have a Dusty Gurle who runs Colorado Organization for Latina Reproductive Rights and stands up, that's, she's a daughter of the movement. When we have Rudy Gonzalez running Servicios de la Raza and, and taking it when it was gonna die and bring it back up to serving our people, that's a son of the movement. So it's what you do with where you're at, not where you're at. What are you doing about it? Mm -hmm. So that's my, and, and if you know, I'm sorry, brother, if you know these people are doing that, I'd be telling them up front, hey, I want to talk to you. I don't need to do it in the newspaper. I need to tell you one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. what you're doing is, okay, effed up, 
And every time you try, I'm going to call you out. So don't pretend to be what you're not. So that's what the movement was at. That's how I was taught to do things. But also, to, Debbie, to Deborah's point, there were times, yeah, I was silent, and I shouldn't have been. There were times I sat back, and I shouldn't have. But at the, at the same time, I erred as well, and people should have ca called me on the carpet about it. And so now, I'm humbled by that, and people do. But don't try and call me out on Facebook or social. I don't like, I'm not even on that stuff. I don't even know. I, I can't. I tell my daughter, I don't even know. Don't put me on, take me. I don't know what go, to goes on there. If I want to tell you something, I want your name. I want to meet you at your address or mine so I could tell you what I need to tell you. I ain't texting you either. I don't do that either. <laughs> People text me, I have something to say, and I, good, I'm glad you do. Where do you want to meet for coffee? Let's meet then. Or come to my house. You have something to say, don't be texting me. Don't be Facebooking all over the place. Don't Instagram and do the X or Twitter. Uh-uh. Come tell me to my face like a good human being would do. And I will listen to you that way and hopefully learn from you that way. So that's one of my biggest things that I like to say in answer to your question. But to me, it is not dead when we have got rid of Columbus Day in the state of Colorado, the birthplace of Columbus. I don't care that they named it Mother Cabrini. What do I care? I just didn't want the holiday of Columbus. I don't care if the Italians want, or take Mother Cabrini, I don't care. I don't, it doesn't matter to me, I don't get a day off. There's no day off or retirement from struggle and standing up for justice and equality. There's no day off. There's no time off. And if Dolores Huerta is my hero, Shiro, because she's already 92 and got arrested in San Francisco for migrant rights. Okay, that's my hero, because she's not stopped. Um, and I agree with everything that Nita just said there, because she's, she's right about that. The movement is not dead. It's not dead. Um, and we should not see it as dead, and we all need to keep on moving. Yeah, we all need to keep on working. We all need to keep on struggling, whether it's indigenous rights, whether it's um, uh, social justice, whatever it is, we have to keep on moving because obviously these things still exist. Yeah, these, these um, um, indignities, yeah, they still exist. Um, what I've seen, um, I, 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 I understand what you're saying, yeah, that, that there's a, there's, a, we used to use the word politicos, right, the ones that, they, they know a lot of words, and then you ask them a question, like, you know, I don't know, a simple question, and then they, they start running you around a tree with a lot of big words, you know, and then they confuse the people, right? I just ignore them after about the first two rounds around the tree, you know, then I'm like, okay, they're, they're, they're not helpful, yeah? Um, and we do need to call out those politicos in that way, right? Those who think that just because they have 501c3 status, Right? They have a little bit of money and a little bit of power. And it doesn't last very long unless they keep on making their, their uh, uh, grants for themselves to, contain, to maintain their little bit of money and their little bit of power. Yeah? They, those ones need to be called out. You know? And um, I think it's important that we call out people, but they gotta listen, they don't wanna listen. Yeah? They, they, they're saying, oh, you old, I've had, you elders, you don't know what you're talking about. And it's like, Okay, I guess you think we don't. Um, so, so there's a lot that, of work that needs to be done. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people doing, uh, doing things that are contrary um, to the work that needs to be done. Um, but um, anyway, I know you spend a lot of time, but honestly, I don't care how much time we spend, and I know maybe they're gonna throw us out. I'm gonna tell you some of the things that Corky taught me, okay? Because I was one of those kids that was going to every splash in, and I listened to Corky speak about a thousand times before I turned 18 years old, right? And there's things I remember. And this, and I'm gonna name a few of them. We are not east side, west side, north side, south side. We are one people. We are the Chicano people. We were able to go to any park. We never had to worry about where we were and who would attack us, because nobody would. We were one people. And he repeated that over and over and over again. Right, and I learned that. I, I was very young, I, I absorbed everything. 
Um, this is my favorite, one of my favorites. And correct me if I say any of these wrong, okay? If you live in the dumpster, you're gonna smell like the garbage. You remember that one? I heard that so many times. If you live in the dumpster, you're gonna smell like the garbage. Now, it doesn't say if you live in the barrio. It doesn't say if you live in the ghetto. It says, no, if you live in the dumpster. Just because you're in the barrio doesn't mean you're ignorant, right? It's when you take on that ignorance and accept that ignorance for yourself. And this is probably the one, uh, there's, a, there's a, a million, but the one that really stands out to me is, um, Quirky always used to say this, and I, I tried to bring this up to some of those politicos, and they just tore me to bits. You can't sit on the fence. You gotta get off, you have to step off on one side or the other, or else you will be pushed off on one side or the other, or you will fall off to one side or the other. Right? You cannot be on the fence. He used to say this, if you sit on the fence and stay neutral, neutral comes from the word neutered. Remember, yeah, you remember. When you are neutered, I don't remember the rest, but the way I remember was that you cannot proliferate, you cannot grow, right? Um, I don't remember what he said. Asina, asina no ma, asi, yeah? And, and so that stuff was really, really important. Those are some of the main things uh, that I learned uh, from, from Corky, and, and I needed to share that because uh, they were very important. Um, I still read I Am Joaquin every day for some part of it because it, 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 it actually speaks to today just as much as it did when he wrote it. And I love one quote where he said, there are no revolutions without poets. So poetry was, the spoken word mm -hmm. was very powerful in his mind and he did a good job of that. Mm -hmm. He had some great quotes for us mm -hmm. to keep us in line. Yeah. And, and speaking of Joaquin, and I, some of, we, we did a little uh, uh, presentation the other day, and the one thing that, what, that really stood out to me and still does is that I will not be absorbed. And when I say that for me today, that means I will not be absorbed by anyone, by Americana, by any other tribe or nation, ni, ni Mexica, ni any other northern or southern nation, I will not be absorbed, right? Somos Chicanos, somos Mexicanos, somos Chicano. Right, and this is who we are. And we cannot be who we are not, even though they keep telling us we should be who we are not. To this day, we hear that. But for us, you know, that, that has never changed, yeah? And I will not be absorbed. So, so I ask you to remember some of these things, you know, and don't be afraid to ask us questions. How, uh, invite us to ask us questions, not just put pretty clothes on us and say, sit there and say nice things and tell, say how good everything was, yeah? Quali, 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 so good. Everything is so good. But no, we have to look at what we could do better, right? We need to remember the one operative word. Although we call it Chicano movement, it was the Chicano struggle. It, is a, it was a struggle, and struggles have the good, bad, and ugly of it. And we just are honest and recognize it, and learn from it, and progress and do better. And that's what I, I always strive to do, to do better. I also have a quote of his, because you're gonna run into people in your lives, as Deborah has said. I have as well. I could even recount some of the ugliness so yeah, I've gone through, but you've never had your stuff spray painted on I-70 that you're this or you're that, but I have, Nito Gonzalez. But I'll never forget that, that the important thing is that we understand its struggle and that there are going to be people throwing arrows at you, daggers at you, uh, but my dad, how he did this, I don't know, and he did. He said he thought in his older years when I'd come vent to him and going through putting up with people being disrespectful, hateful, inhumane, um, he said, I know, but you always leave the door open for people to come home. So he taught me to have grace. And that was hard with my temper that I've worked on all my life. So just so you know, he taught me to have grace. That the raza, you try to leave the door open. You're not blind to it. You're not ignorant about what they do. But that they will see the light and be able to come home and be a good human being. Yeah. One, more, 
Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Real quick. I know for our folks online that our interpreter needs to leave or has left. Uh, no, hasn't left yet. Okay, but we are going to continue to wrap this up here. The, it, this is being recorded and will be translated and accessible in Spanish um, at a later date. Um, so we want to continue just to acknowledge that aspect of participation. And thanks, Jasmine, for staying late here. Um, but yes, Deborah. Um, just one that's important, I think. Um, Malcolm X, 1964. The ballot or the bullet. This is something that we are, we are looking at very um, seriously today. It's being, it's being given to us to look at. We're not searching for it, the ballot or the bullet. So for all of these youngsters who are always telling me can no, no van a votar, right? For whatever reasons, they say that they're not gonna vote. Well, even when you don't vote, you vote. Right? And through all of our struggle over those many years and all the marches and all the, all the conferences and all the events, voting was a part of that. So please vote because now, right now, with what the world we're living in, that is, that, those are our choices right now, the ballot or the bullet. Um, I, I just want to add to that real quick. I'm so glad you brought that up because... Um, my dad voted, y'all. That radical voted. I don't know who he wrote in. I don't know what he did, because there were people he didn't like, but he pulled that lever, and he drug us with him. And so I do write in, and you know, if I don't like someone either, I'm like, oh, God, I can't do either one. Who do I like? You know, I'm going to write in Deborah. But, um, but I go and I vote. But what really turned it for me, because I was reluctant. I was very reluctant, didn't want to have anything to do with it. I ran in, I ran, I, I went to School of Ilif. I was on a panel with a couple of people, Mayan, uh, from the Yucatan, uh, a Mayan elder, and then uh, un Mexican uh, from the, you know, Mexico City. And when I talked about how I didn't know if I could, should vote, I don't what for, all of this and that. The Mayan got up and said, in his, they had to translate from his language to Spanish to English, and he was very distraught. He told me, he told us he walked 100 miles so that he could vote in Mexico. That how, in, how shame on you, basically. That is, you can even, you know, do it, you know, drop it off everywhere, do whatever. He was, that's what he said. He was, that it shamed him. And then the Mexicana from, says how they struggle to get the ability to vote. And so I just want to share that story because it opened my eyes about how easy we can do some things and we choose not to. Yeah. Thank you for these powerful quotes. Thank you for just all of this wisdom. And, you know, I truly think we could probably speak all night on so many different things. And I want to honor, you know, y'all's time as well. But let's please give our panelists a round of applause and gratitude for their presence this evening. Thank you all so, so much. Um, I also just want to share a few other uh, appreciations. Um, thank you again to the Colorado Trust for financially supporting this series. Thank you to WAFA for supporting with the coordination of all the logistics. To the Regis University Office of Diversity and Inclusion Excellence um, for supporting us to be hosted here at Regis this, to this evening and for the series overall. Um, to our AV with um, Denver Open Media for archiving all of these materials and helping us make it accessible to our community at large. And thanks to each of you for coming and spending your time this evening um, to learn about this history, to listen. Um, and I hope that we feel inspired to not be silent as we move forward 
in that spirit. Our next session, it will be our final session of this series on November 9th and focused on the history of the American Indian movement, both nationally and in the story of Colorado. So I hope you will join us then. And thank you once again for being here this evening. I hope you have a good night. Thank you.